Hello everyone. Today, we'll journey through the captivating history of taxonomy and evolutionary biology, exploring the influential thinkers who have shaped our understanding of biodiversity and evolutionary processes. Let's take a moment to outline the path we'll follow today. We'll begin with Aristotle, whose system of classification laid some of the earliest foundations for organizing the natural world. Moving forward in time, we'll encounter Linnaeus, whose 1753 classification system revolutionized taxonomy by providing a standardized way to categorize species. Next, we'll explore Lamarck's 1809 theory, which proposed that organisms could pass on acquired characteristics to their offspring. His theory of use and disuse, combined with the inheritance of acquired characteristics, represented an early attempt to explain evolutionary change before the mechanisms of genetics were fully understood. Our journey then takes us to Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection, published in 1859. Darwin's work presented a mechanism for evolutionary change, highlighting the roles of variation, adaptation, and survival of the fittest in shaping the diversity of life on Earth. We'll then examine the modern synthesis, which integrated genetics and evolution, and touch upon subsequent advancements. Finally, we'll conclude with reflections on the overarching themes and the continued relevance of this field. This structured approach will help us appreciate the progression of ideas and the enduring impact they've had on our understanding of life. Let's begin! As we delve into the history of taxonomy and evolutionary biology, it's essential to highlight their significance. Taxonomy provides the foundation for biology, offering a systematic way to classify and understand life. It serves as the alphabet of biology, enabling global communication about organisms with clarity. Evolutionary biology, anchored by Darwin's theory, is more than just the study of how life diversified. It's a unifying theory that permeates various scientific disciplines, from medicine to conservation. By tracing evolutionary relationships, it reveals life's interconnectedness and offers insights into species adaptations and histories. Understanding evolution equips us to address modern challenges, such as antibiotic resistance and climate change. In essence, both taxonomy and evolutionary biology are foundational pillars of our understanding of life. Long before Carl Linnaeus revolutionized the classification of living organisms in the 18th century, ancient scholars had laid the foundational stones in the realm of taxonomy. Foremost among these thinkers was the great philosopher, Aristotle. Aristotle was not only a philosopher but also a biologist who wrote books on many scientific disciplines, including taxonomy. His approach to taxonomy was rooted in keen observations of the natural world. Rather than merely categorizing species based on their appearances, he delved deeper, studying their behaviors, habitats, and anatomical structures. Aristotle posited that living beings possess distinct types of souls. He believed that plants possessed only a vegetative soul, responsible for growth and reproduction. Animals, on the other hand, had both a sensitive soul, which governed their ability to move and sense their surroundings, and a vegetative soul. Humans were considered unique, as they were believed to possess all three souls, vegetative, sensitive, and rational, enabling them to think and reflect. Aristotle observed and classified more than 500 species of animals and dissected many of them. Based on this work, he wrote several books on the ecology and embryonic development of animals and advocated for the theory of spontaneous generation. This theory suggests that living things can arise accidentally from non-living substances such as soil or rotten wood. One of Aristotle's most notable contributions to taxonomy was his system of classification based on the ladder of life, often referred to as the scala naturae or the great chain of being. In this hierarchical system, organisms were arranged from simplest to most complex, with humans occupying the pinnacle due to their perceived superior intellectual abilities. While Aristotle's taxonomy was groundbreaking for its time, it was not without its shortcomings. His system lacked the rigorous classification criteria that would later be developed. Additionally, his classifications often reflected the philosophical beliefs of his era rather than strictly empirical observations. Nevertheless, his contributions laid the groundwork for future scholars and thinkers. His emphasis on observation, systematic categorization, and the interconnectedness of life provided a solid foundation upon which the edifice of modern taxonomy would be built. 
Jumping ahead to the 18th century, we encounter Carl Linnaeus, often hailed as the father of modern taxonomy. Carl Linnaeus stands as a monumental figure in this domain. He proposed a systematic method for classifying living organisms and, by clarifying the concept of a species, the basic unit of classification, he devised binomial nomenclature, a notation for the scientific name of a species. The Linnaean system brought order to the vast diversity of life. In 1753, Linnaeus published a species plant Arum, a work now internationally accepted as the starting point of modern botanical nomenclature. The image on the right is the cover page of the first edition of his book. In detail, binomial nomenclature is a standardized naming system that assigns each organism with a unique two-part name, comprising its genus and species. This name, known as a scientific name, is internationally accepted only when determined in accordance with the International Code of Nomenclature. A scientific name is written in Latin or is treated grammatically as if it were a phrase in the Latin language. The first part of the name is the generic name, identifying the genus to which the species belongs. The second part, the specific name, distinguishes the species within the genus. Both the generic name and the specific name are typeset in italics. The first letter of the generic name is capitalized, while that of the specific name is not. The specific name is usually followed by the authority, the scientist who first published the name, though the authority may be omitted. Here's L is the standard abbreviation for Linnaeus. Linnaeus's approach not only brought order to the chaotic landscape of naming, but also laid the groundwork for a universal language in biology. Beyond naming conventions, Linnaeus's classifications were rooted in the morphological species concept. Morphology refers to the physical structures and characteristics of an organism. Thus, a morphological species is a group of organisms with similar forms and structures that distinguish them from other organisms. The morphological species concept is particularly useful in the field of paleontology. However, it can be misleading, as evidenced by the willow warbler and chiffchaff, which have very similar physical traits but do not interbreed. By categorizing organisms based on shared physical traits, Linnaeus sought to reflect their evolutionary relationships using the knowledge and tools available at his time. As we transition to subsequent slides, it's crucial to recognize that while taxonomy began with morphology, it has evolved dramatically. Today, with the integration of genetics, molecular biology, and advanced computational methods, taxonomy offers insights into the intricate evolutionary relationships among organisms, reshaping our understanding of life's interconnected web. As we shift to evolutionary biology, we encounter John Baptiste Lamarck. He proposed an intriguing idea, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Lamarck argued that traits that are used develop, while traits that are not used degenerate. He believed that organisms could pass on traits they acquired during their lifetimes to their offspring. In 1809, Lamarck published Philosophie zur Logique a work regarded as the most comprehensive discussion of his views on inheritance. The image on the right is the title page of the first edition of his book. Lamarck's ideas of use versus disuse and soft inheritance are well illustrated in this book. Here is an excerpt from the English translation by Hugh Elliot. First law, in every animal which has not passed the limit of its development, a more frequent and continuous use of any organ gradually strengthens, develops and enlarges that organ, and gives it a power proportional to the length of time it has been so used, while the permanent disuse of any organ imperceptibly weakens and deteriorates it, and progressively diminishes its functional capacity until it finally disappears. Second law, all the acquisitions or losses wrought by nature on individuals, through the influence of the environment in which their race has long been placed, and hence through the influence of the predominant use or permanent disuse of any organ. All these are preserved by reproduction to the new individuals which arise, provided that the acquired modifications are common to both sexes, or at least to the individuals which produce the young. One of his notable examples was the elongation of a giraffe's neck, suggesting that generations of stretching to reach higher leaves would lead to longer neck descendants. Another well-known illustration is how a blacksmith's work enhances the muscles in his arms leading his sons to acquire comparable muscle development as they grow older. While some aspects of Lamarck's ideas have been refined or reconsidered, 
His contributions raised foundational questions about how species change over time. The 19th century marks a pivotal moment in the history of biology, the Darwinian Revolution. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection challenged traditional beliefs, providing a compelling explanation for the diversity of life on Earth. The image on the right is the title page of his seminal 1859 book, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. In On the Origin of Species, Darwin presented a mechanism by which species could adapt and evolve in response to their environments. His observations during his voyage on the Beagle, coupled with meticulous research, shed light on the intricacies of adaptation and the profound interconnectedness of life. Darwin argued that variations exist among living things, and only those that adapt well to their environment survive. He proposed that these variations accumulate, leading to evolution. To illustrate natural selection more clearly, consider a simple example from Khan Academy. Imagine a colony of nine mice, with six tan and three black. This colony has migrated to a region where the terrain is black and hawks prey on mice. Not surprisingly, the hawks would find it easier to spot and capture the tan mice. Consequently, more tan mice would fall victim to the hawks than black ones. Over time, this selective pressure would increase the proportion of black mice in the population. This shift in inheritable traits exemplifies the process of evolution. Darwin's theory had profound implications beyond the life sciences, influencing politics and society. In the late 19th century, Herbert Spencer applied evolutionary principles to society, giving rise to the concept of social Darwinism. Within this framework, it was suggested that societies also evolve, with only the most adaptable surviving due to competitive pressures. Furthermore, some proponents of social Darwinism contended that human inequality was natural, using this belief to support ideas such as racism and colonial rule. This perspective was erroneously used to justify the dominance of advanced, or's fit societies over others. The White Man's Burden, a poem by Rudyard Kipling, further propagated this notion, advocating the idea that the white, or European races had a duty to civilize the less developed of peoples through colonial rule. The image on the right depicts an editorial cartoon representing the white man's burden. Another noteworthy figure in evolutionary biology is Alfred Russell Wallace. Parallel to Darwin, Wallace independently formulated similar theories. Their joint presentation of evolutionary principles emphasized the consensus and robustness of the evolutionary framework, establishing it as one of the most influential theories in science. The image on the right showcases the Darwin, the Wallace Medal, which is awarded to individuals who have made significant contributions to the field of evolutionary biology. Reflecting on these pioneering figures and their contributions, it becomes evident that evolutionary biology is not merely a study of the past. It offers a lens through which we can understand the present diversity of life, the historical processes that shaped it, and the potential trajectories for the future. As we continue our exploration, it's essential to recognize a pivotal period known as the modern synthesis in the mid-20th century. The modern synthesis integrated Darwinian evolution with the principles of Mendelian genetics, creating a comprehensive framework that explained patterns of biodiversity. This integration was transformative, uniting the study of natural selection with the mechanisms of heredity, and bridging the gap between macroevolutionary patterns and microevolutionary processes. The advent of molecular biology, particularly DNA sequencing, revolutionized our tools for studying taxonomy and evolutionary biology. DNA analysis enabled more precise classification and phylogenetic reconstructions revealing evolutionary relationships at the molecular level. From these advancements, phylogenetics emerged as a powerful discipline. It employs molecular data to construct evolutionary trees, offering unprecedented insights into the evolutionary history and relationships among species. These trees serve as roadmaps, guiding our understanding of life's intricate tapestry. The image illustrates a phylogenetic tree showing the three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Furthermore, the integration of computational methods and bioinformatics has accelerated our pace of discovery. 
Advanced algorithms now aid in analyzing vast datasets, predicting evolutionary trajectories, and even designing conservation strategies. The image on the left displays a heat map representing jacquard distances for nuclear profiles in computational biology, while the image on the right illustrates sequences being evaluated in a muscle multiple sequence alignment in the field of bioinformatics. In summary, the modern era has not only refined our foundational theories, but has also equipped us with powerful tools to navigate the complexities of life's evolutionary journey. These advancements underscore the dynamic nature of taxonomy and evolutionary biology, which remain continually evolving fields that bridge the past with the future of biological science. As we reflect on this journey, we witness a tapestry woven by brilliant minds. From Linnaeus's classification system to Darwin's theory of natural selection, each discovery has deepened our appreciation of life's complexity. In essence, taxonomy is not merely about naming, it's about understanding, tracing, and appreciating the rich tapestry of life, from its ancient roots to the present diversity. Modern tools and technologies continue to propel us forward, ensuring that the study of taxonomy and evolutionary biology remains vibrant and ever-evolving. These fields emphasize the interconnected web of life's diversity and its shared evolutionary journey. Thank you for joining me on this exploration. Let's continue to marvel at the wonders of life and the minds that illuminate its mysteries. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.